Crossing dimensions of time and space. Technology beyond comprehension. They are watching. They are waiting. We're not having nightmares. This has got to be real. They are already here. No matter where we went, they would always find us. Alder Grove, British Columbia. Located in the fertile Fraser Valley, it's an average working class town where everyday life is simple and good. When my husband and I split up, then I decided that I wanted a better life, a quieter life for my children, somewhere where I felt they would be safe. So decided to look at Alder Grove and move there. The night of July 17th, 1991, started just like any other. The kids were in bed, they were asleep, and I had a friend who came to visit me. He'd actually talked about marriage at that point. Thank you. There you go. Oh, that's the way I like it. It was quite warm, so we decided to go outside on the back patio just to, to have our tea out there. It's a nice, beautiful, you know, summer night. Oh, beautiful night. Oh, it's nice out here. Mm. Your scalloped potatoes are incredible. Thanks, it's the cream. And I remember all of a sudden feeling this strange humming in my abdomen. And I said, do you feel that? He said, yes, I was going to ask you if you felt that. OK, what is that? That's weird. And I said, look up. Tom. Wow. This thing was about the size of a football field, if not bigger was cloaked and i say that because the only way that you could see the exact shape of it was that it blocked out the stars that's crazy there were no lights no sound and it was just floating along and then it stopped dead on a dime I felt claustrophobic and i said well is it gonna stop coming down he couldn't handle it this is dangerous we should go inside come on Let's go inside. I'm out of here. I'm going inside, and you'd better come in with me. He ran inside. I stayed there. To me, it felt like maybe two minutes, three minutes at the most, and I was just watching it. And then it was there, and then it wasn't. There you are. He just said... <laughs> Where have you been? Where'd you go? I've looked all over for you. You've been gone for quite a while. What? I've been right here. I'm watching whatever that Listen, was. Listen, I came out with the tea and you left. I said I didn't go anywhere. <laughs> what are you I talking about? I looked everywhere about? for you. I went into the woods. I went to the end of the driveway trying to find him. An hour. I said I was outside just for a few minutes. And he said, no, you've been gone over 45 minutes. I said, that's impossible. Tom, I've been standing right here looking up at whatever that was in the sky. Yeah, for I'm now. telling you, I was only out there two or three minutes. I think you're just, you know, a little nervous about this thing you saw. And he said, no. He said, look at the clock. I thought I should stick around because the kids would be by themselves while you were gone. You've been gone almost an hour, 45 minutes. And he said, I didn't know what to think. And you just disappeared. There's no explanation. I've been you standing know. here the whole time, Tom. Tom, I you like went inside, you put the teacups down. You know, I have been standing here. This disappearing act is just not, it doesn't what work. What are you, Tom? I had no idea where I'd been. After that happened, he never came back again. I got a phone call, I'm sorry, goodbye. Yeah. And it's like, okay, well, what do we do with this now? 
What we witnessed was this huge boomerang-shaped ship. It was probably over the size of a football field big. And who do I tell? You're not sure you want to contact somebody and tell them about it because you don't want to be ridiculed. But things didn't match up. Things weren't right. And then the next day, I contacted the planetarium in Vancouver. I said, did you get any other calls? And they said, no, but I'll put you in touch with Vancouver, UFO Vancouver, BC. And didn't even realize it was such a thing. Investigators from the UFO Reporting Center in British Columbia take Karina's case. UFO investigators told her that there was uh, 15 other reports that night of similar objects. I've gone through the records of UFO BC, and we've had about uh, eight uh, UFO reports of boomerang-shaped craft. It just confirmed that what we had seen was not imaginary. There, was, there really was something, because there had been other eyewitness reports that night. Is interstellar travel possible? Astrophysicist Dr. Jamie Matthews is the mission scientist in charge of Canada's first space telescope. I think it's important to keep in mind that the distances between stars are so vast uh, that if you're traveling in the conventional sense and if you're restricted by the, the universal speed limit of the speed of light, 300,000 kilometers per second, it's a high speed. But even at that incredible pace, it takes years uh, to cross the distance between even the nearest neighboring stars. Our fastest space probes would take tens of thousands of years uh, to reach the nearest neighboring star. So if, if people had uh, a real intuition for interstellar distances, they would probably think more carefully about how likely it is that aliens are, are traversing those distances to visit us and how often they would do it. I'm not saying it's impossible, but it's not as easy as it looks. What if interstellar travel isn't the only way aliens visit Earth? You know, maybe if we have visitors, they're not coming from another place in our three-dimensional spatial universe. Maybe they're coming from another set of dimensions within a much larger multiverse. There could be many, many dimensions of space and time, of which our three spatial dimensions and our one temporal dimension are just a subset of them. But if you're going to connect across dimensions, uh, you, you need to somehow tear a hole in the, in the geometries. If creatures have found a way to do this, uh, then they have developed a very sophisticated technology. If it's happening by accident, they found some natural phenomena that, that we have not yet encountered. I didn't know what to believe. I realized that there was something very strange happening. There's one, two, three a year that really stand out, uh, like the one with the Karina, that really, you know, demand more attention. This giant boomerang-shaped uh, craft uh, flew over them. Before that happened, though, the, everything went quiet. All the frogs stopped croaking, a dead silence. 45 minutes or an hour had gone by that wasn't accounted for. She doesn't recall what happened with that missing time. So where was she? I'm not sure what happened, what took place. In July 1991, a massive object hovers over Karina Sable's house in Aldergrove, BC. Oh, that's crazy. Karina learns that she disappeared for more than 45 minutes, missing time she can't account for. There you are. Yeah, I'm... I'm... Tom, I've been standing right here looking up at whatever that was in the sky. Yeah, for an hour. 
an hour to listen. Okay, this is really weird because this now makes me think of what happened as a child. Didn't really know what name to put to it, what it was. It was in October, close to Halloween, and my little friends had come over and they said, you know, come out with us, we're gonna go play in the, in the forest. Haha, <laughs> you're it, don't scare me like that. Somebody suggested we play hide and seek, and it came time for my turn, you know, to kind of hide up against the tree and try and find everyone else. One, two. Five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Ready or not, here I come. Then there was no sound. I couldn't hear the children. I, could, I, I couldn't see them. Come on, guys, where are you? All of a sudden, it was like a strange, musty smell came around me, kind of enveloped me. And it was like shivers. And then the next thing I know, I'm, I've, I've got this fear inside of me. I'm just terrified. I, I don't dare look back to what's following me, but I know something's behind me. Finally, I reached my home, and everybody is panicking. My parents are crying, and, you know, they're screaming, where have you been? All the kids have been back for a long time. Where were you? To this day, I have no idea where I was or what happened, but I know that there was time missing. There's a, an enormous number of sightings where there's missing time involved, where, where people don't remember what happened to them directly after this two or three hour gap in their life. So uh, this is typical of abductees. So at that time, he just explained that abduction, you know, was when they come and they would take these people and they do things to them. And they sometimes return from abduction events with unusual marks and scars and bruises on their body. But the key word here is scars. They return with fully formed scars that were not there the day before. And that is biologically impossible. And I said, well, some of that's starting to make sense now, because I would wake up and I would have certain marks on my body. And he said, well, you know, some people who claim they've been abducted um, have what we call a scoop mark. So it's, it can be on your leg or somewhere else on your body. Since I was a child, I've had a mark on my leg. I don't know where it came from. I mean, I never really understood what was going on. I went and saw a doctor, and I asked him to check it out to tell me what he thought it was. He didn't really come up with a specific answer. Is the unexplained mark evidence of an abduction experience? Well, definitely you question yourself. Um, I never have taken any drugs. I didn't drink. I still don't. You feel absolutely and totally alone because you don't know who's going to believe you. I mean, if I was listening to someone else at that time, I would have said, I don't know if I should believe this. Over the next few weeks, Karina tries to put the sighting behind her. I had put the children to bed and I went to bed myself and I just, you know, closed my eyes.
haunted by mysterious gaps in her life and unexplained marks on her body, Karina fears she may have been abducted by aliens. Weeks after witnessing a large object hovering over her house in Aldergrove, British Columbia, things take a nightmarish turn. What I saw literally was this being, uh, about three feet tall, I guess, pear-shaped head, kind of grayish color. I felt terrified. There was a feeling, a sense that I'd seen him before, but wasn't positive. So I would see its image, like it would be there, and then its image would appear in front of it, and in front of it, and in front of it. So I don't know how else to describe that. It was kind of floating into her room. It's here. It's got to be here. I saw it come in here. But there was nothing, and my daughter was asleep. So I thought, oh boy, here we go. I've had a bad dream. I seriously thought of putting myself in a psych ward. It's when those things happen, it's the first thing I think of is my children. How can I protect them? How can I stop all this? You know, on a mental, emotional, and spiritual level, you begin to question everything. I was brought up Catholic. So there's God, there's this, there's that, and then all of a sudden, well, who are we? Where are we really from? Who are these beings, and, and what is it all about? Why are we here? And then you feel absolutely and totally alone. Dr. Caleb Scharf runs the Astrobiology Center at Columbia University, looking for clues as to whether or not there's life beyond Earth. We are trying very, very hard in modern science today to, to find out whether or not we are genuinely alone in our solar system or alone in the universe as a whole. So until very recently, we just didn't know for sure that there are other planets around other stars. With modern technology, we've been able to eke out the signatures of planets around other stars. The fact that there are so many planets out there is quite surprising because it means that planets form incredibly efficiently in this galaxy and probably in the universe as a whole. And that means that the opportunity for there to be planets a bit like the Earth or somehow similar enough to harbor life goes up enormously. I think we're sitting at 763 confirmed planets and more than 2,000 candidate planets. Our galaxy is packed with planets. There are more planets than stars. And we didn't know that a few years ago. And among those planets are a huge number of smaller planets that may be rocky, terrestrial-like planets, a bit like the Earth. The Goldilocks zone, which is sometimes called the habitable zone, is the region around a star where if you placed a planet like the Earth, it has the possibility of having a surface temperature somewhere between the freezing point and the boiling point of water. In other words, it's at the right distance from the star to be kept at a nice temperature. And the reason we're so interested in a planet that can have liquid water on its surface is that life can't exist without water in a liquid form. If you think about Earth, all the oxygen that we breathe essentially comes from plants and microorganisms. And a lot of the chemistry of our planet has been determined over four billion years of evolution by the microbial organisms living here. So when we look at alien worlds, what we're really looking for are the signatures of that kind of life. We're looking for environmental clues that life is playing a role in what happens on the surface of that planet. Obviously, we make a lot of assumptions when we talk about things like the Goldilocks zone and the need for water, because we're assuming that life out there 
somehow like life here. Is that right? We don't know is the, the real answer. But we need to start somewhere. And the best way to begin is to use what you know as a template in the search for new things. What's this? Oh, that's the little white ghost. The little white ghost? Who are these beings, and, and what is it all about? Well, she comes into my bedroom sometimes, and she scares me a little bit, but she doesn't hurt me. Sweetie, who's that? And then my daughter says, I don't like the pumpkin head man. Well, he said that he's the doctor. The doctor? Yeah. And I'm really scared of him because he hurts me. He scares me a little bit. Oh, that's the doctor. That's the doctor. That's the doctor. After discovering her daughter has been painting disturbing images, Corina Sables is convinced something has been visiting her daughter's room in Aldergrove, British Columbia. Our perception of aliens in, in, in writing and in film and television is all governed by our perception of ourselves. And so we try to have wild extrapolations, but really we can't because we have only one example of complex life here on Earth. Alien life may not look so different from us. It may have two arms, two legs, two eyes, and so on, because that is a natural solution to the problem of having a functioning organism. Life has to subscribe to the same rules that, it, that govern us here the laws of physics, the laws of chemistry and biochemistry and so on, but how they manifest themselves, you know, how you go from simple organisms to complex organisms, it, it, it seems logical to us based on what we know about life here. We're saying, okay, you know, well, they've got to have like two eyes and stereoscopic vision. They, gotta, they should have two legs to balance themselves you know, or whatever. But well, who knows? The other side of the coin is that evolution is a much more random process, in which case there could be alien life out there that has no resemblance to us whatsoever, but it senses things, it moves, it thinks, but it does it in a very, very different way. That, too, is, is a valid viewpoint. We just don't know yet which way it's going to go. Every time that we have had the capability of looking at the universe in different ways, to open our eyes to new regions of wavelength in the electromagnetic spectrum, or new time scales, or new distances, we've been surprised. Oh, that's the little white ghost. <laughs> When my daughter uh, ended up telling me about the doctor, it definitely brought me back to what really happened in Alder Grove. And all of a sudden, all these pieces of the puzzle were being put together. I remember being taken up in a very, very large um, ship, for lack of a better word. It was a gigantic room, and it was round. Um, it wasn't lit very well. It was subdued lighting. It had a strange smell in the air, very cold. And I would just be placed on this stainless steel table. All of a sudden, to my left, um, this tall being with very bony structure 
Falcon started approaching me. He had a huge head, and it was kind of like lots of bone structure to his head. Large, black, almond-shaped eyes, slits for a mouth, uh, no nose to speak of, no ears, um, very scrawny little body, and I remember feeling terrified. He didn't say it with his lips, I just heard in my mind, he said, I'm the doctor. It was almost like, what's he going to do to me? Dr. David Jacobs has spent 25 years researching the abduction phenomena. A typical abduction event is a person is taken out of their normal environment. They're then placed on, on this table and they have an examination of sorts. Uh, and I say of sorts because it's not a normal kind of examination. It's routinely sperm is taken and eggs are harvested. There was another room that was there, and in this particular place, you could see hundreds of what looked like aquariums. And all these fetuses were in them. And I remember thinking, oh my God, and realized that they're coming, implanting women, and then they come back and they remove fetuses from us. And this is what virtually all women say. And the goal is the production of these hybrid human-looking beings. Cross between alien and human. It all became very clear what was going on. I always seemed to have female-type problems. And, um, my mother had them as well. We would be pregnant, and then um, we would no longer be pregnant. We'd have miscarriages, but never actually found a fetus. Um, sorry. And that's when I clued in that this is, this is going from generation to generation. If you work with an abductee, there's almost a certainty that uh, either their mother or their father or both were abductees. Now, if that's the case, and it's intergenerational, it also means, it works the other way, it means that the children will be abductees. I think the worst thing was that realizing that this was really real. You know, that, that was terrifying. I was getting angry. I didn't want to believe this. How do we get away from them? What can I do? How can I stop all this? I have to do something to protect my daughter. I, I don't want something happening to her. Looking for a safe haven from the haunting experiences in Aldergrove, British Columbia, Karina Sables picks up and moves her family to the heart of the Okanagan Valley. One morning I just woke up and something told me, grab some boxes, you're moving. And I can't explain it any other way. I know it sounds silly, but that's the way it felt. And for the next 12 years, Karina and her daughter find peace. Kelowna is like the U.S. is California. Very warm weather, semi-desert. Summers are great. A girlfriend of mine had come up from Vancouver to visit. I thought she was not bad. 
it was about like five to midnight or something. It was quite late, and she was leaving the next morning. Yeah, she had a good accent. Suddenly, she said to me, "Why don't we go stargazing?" But I thought, "It's really late. I don't think we're going to do this now." She was so insistent that I eventually I just gave in and said, "Okay, all right, we'll go." I haven't gone stargazing since probably since the last time I saw you. It's so much better than. There was no moon that night, um, no street lights where we ended up going. It was pitch black, beautiful stars out. So I pulled over on the right side, we parked. Here, here, look at this. Let's pull up right here. Okay. Oh, it's perfect. Okay. This is great. I know. Oh, it's beautiful. I know. Oh, my God. And I've got my million and a half candlelight checking for bears and cougars, because they had, had sightings in that area recently. Nice. Yeah. It's good to be out. Ah, oh, it is. Oh. All right. Okay, that's really weird. Right away, she said there's like three pinpoints, like stars in the sky. And they're green. They're neon green. They're coming together in a triangle, but they're green. I don't know, what is that? Airplanes don't do that, helicopters don't do that. Something's going on. They're, huh, they're moving in. I turned on my light just because I was scared. When I first saw the eyes, I thought, okay, it's deer. And then reality checked in and I went, no, these aren't animals, <laughs> this is something else. Once I realized what they were, then I really panicked. I tried yelling and my voice wouldn't hardly come out. I think it was, I was so terrified that I couldn't speak, I couldn't breathe. And I'm trying to tell her to get back in the car. I'm trying to get back to my door, but it's like I'm going in slow motion and then I'm walking in quicksand. At me. I know it's gonna come and get me. I have to get away. And I said it, it, it won't work. It's not coming. I don't believe what just happened. What's going on? What, what's going on? And then we just headed back towards town. Oh my god, we have to get what? away from them. What are you talking we about? We have to get we away. We have to get away. What are you talking about? God. Oh my god. Oh my god. Oh my god, it's right behind us. We're going in here. I said, I can't go home. I can't take these things to my daughter. I said, I don't want something happening with her. I said, we have to keep going. We're going to go park somewhere and wait till this thing leaves. I went down the road further, up the mountain, where all these orchards are. What are you doing? So we looked to the back of the car to see if it was, we could see it through the back windshield, but we couldn't see it. And it was, it was above us, it was above the vehicle. I've got this weird feeling like I've walked through a wall of electricity, that every hair on my, on my body is standing up. It's gone. Okay. What's going on with your clock? Corinna, why is it saying that? Why is it saying... Oh my gosh. Why is it an hour off? She mentions to me there's an hour's missing time and we just got there. How can it be that an hour's missing? Why is it an hour off? Why is it... Oh my God, Why Shirley, is it an hour ahead? We what, have to what, go, we have to go, my daughter. What are you talking about? We have to go. My daughter, oh my God.
Everything seems fine, and my daughter was asleep. But deep inside me, some other part of me understood that there was nothing I could do to stop these things from coming back. Three points, like they're stars? I don't know, but they're moving. And they're green. On July 27, 2003, Karina Sables and her friend experience a terrifying close encounter with aliens. <laughs> Fearing for her daughter's safety, Karina races home only to discover, much to her relief, all is well. Karina immediately reports the incident to UFO investigators in British Columbia. And she learns from ufologist Brian Vike that she and her friend aren't the first to report the sighting. You had over 200 witnesses for one event that took, actually took place on the 27th of 2003, July 2003. It was an amazing event. The phone never stopped. What he said was, we've had a lot more um, sightings. You know, people have eyewitness reports. Um, we have people calling us. We have people emailing us with the same things that you've seen. He saw these green uh, lights uh, going around the sky and hovering and going back and forth and then up and down and then shooting off into, into the distance. It was incredible. Uh, the object ended up um, coming over the mountains, did 90 degree turns, dropped down over lakes. It did another 90 degree and turned up, uh, went over top of people's vehicles on the highway. It was bizarre. Dr. Dow Stein studies atmospheric phenomena that are sometimes mistaken for unidentified flying objects. The meteor is a small lump of material uh, that has come loose in the solar system that's become bound to Earth by gravity and plummets into Earth because it doesn't have enough speed to keep it in orbit. As it plummets to Earth, it eventually interacts with the atmosphere and burns up. In many senses, what's happening is that the material in the meteorite is evaporating off the surface of the meteorite because of friction between this very, very high-speed flying object and an atmosphere. Friction heats it up, evaporates materials off the meteorite, and it leaves them in a streak uh, behind the meteor. Behind that, you very often see a green streak. So you see the meteorite head, a white streak behind it, and then a green zone, and then, then eventually darkness. And that'll always be in pretty much a straight line. Who knows what height it was, how low it was, whether it's a large fragment or a small fragment low down. But any meteorite fragment would be illuminated by the light from the energy of the meteorite. But Karina and her friends saw more than one neon light in the sky that evening. There were three of them, and they were positioned in a triangular formation and kind of going around, moving uh, in strange directions. Some skeptics want to say, well, you know, it could be this, it could be that. But so we were fully awake, lots of eyewitnesses. It was so fast, it was unbelievable. The next morning, Karina suffers from a massive headache. I'm just sitting there trying to figure out what happened the night before. Morning, Shirley. Hi. My friend gets up and she said, you know, I really don't feel well this morning. She said, something's wrong. How did you sleep last night? Oh, I don't feel well at all. Yeah, I have a bit of a headache too. Something wrong. A headache. I feel um, big excitement last night, maybe. Oh, I don't know. Oh my gosh, Shirley. Shirley. Oh, yeah, my nose, nose is bleeding. bleeding. Oh my god. Oh god, that's awful. Oh. oh Shirley, let's take my nose. She's got a bleeding nose. Like I've seen bleeding noses before. It was quite intense. And she says, 
You know, something's wrong. She said, I've got pain down my back. I've got, I've got something wrong with my back. Yes, I'll show you. It really hurts. I feel like I, I don't know what I did. I, it's a bruise or something. Oh, jeez. Surely you have a burn. You have a burn what? on your back. And it was a, a big circular, what looked like a radiation burn. Oh, my God. It really hurts. How did you? I don't know. It really hurts. Hi, sweetie. Um, I don't feel so good. Mickey, you look awful. Yeah, I feel like I'm gonna throw up. Okay. Oh my gosh, Nikki. Oh my god, maybe this. My daughter says, you know, Mom, she says, I think I've got the flu or something. I really feel like throwing up. And then her nose starts bleeding. I went, okay, th this is not normal anymore. It hit me like a ton of bricks, and I went, no matter what I did to try and keep them away, they still got to her. They got to my daughter. That's why she has, she also has a bleeding nose and there was nothing I could do. No matter where we went or how far we would go, they would always find us. For Karina, the recent experience confirms her worst fears. The last experience left me pretty raw and open again, you know, to, to remind me that they are in control or that they can still come and do what they want and that there's nothing I can do about it. I can't stop them. No matter where we went or how far we would go, they would always find us. Abductees lead very unusual lives. They know that a whole series of bizarre things have been happening to them. They live in fear. It's going to continue to happen. They stay up awake all night long. A lot of people can't go to sleep at all without the TV on, without lights on. Some people can't go to sleep without a knife or a gun underneath their pillow. So I wish more people would come forward and say that they're abductees and we need them to do it en masse. I'm not here to try and, and, and prove or make people believe that these are real and this has really happened. You can't let, let this consume you because if you do, you won't survive. If I'm 50-something and I'm still here, then they're probably not going to kill me. They may take me again, but I'll still come back. And I may not be able to protect my children, but they've watched me. And because of the way that I've handled things, they are better able to handle what possibly will happen with their own children or grandchildren down the road, who knows? We're not sure why they keep coming back, but they do come back, always.